Hey, listen. Is your mouth tiny and small? Then why don't you come down a little bit? Little bits. Wait, where, where the food is tiny? It looks like regular food, but really tiny. It's just tiny and tiny and fits right in. <laughs> fits right in. Little bits. We got tiny of lasagna, tiny pizza, tiny pie. Mmm, little tiny fried eggs. Hey, got, hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at Little Bits. It's food that's real tiny and small and, oh, shit, we got a tiny, tiny whisk. Okay, Andy, leave the silly voices to the professionals. This is Tiny Whisk's moment to shine, and he's going to be joined by some tiny friends. First up, tiny lasagna, for which we're going to need some fresh pasta so we can roll it out really, really super thin. I'm just going to warn you guys that I'm going to make tiny foods out of normal-sized batches, so please don't be mad at me. I figured this is what they would do in the restaurant business anyway, so if anything, I'm being accurate, right? Anyway, back to the actual cooking. As you can see, we're beating three large eggs and a little bit of kosher salt into probably about about 14 ounces of all-purpose flour, using a bench scraper and ultimately our hands to bring it all together into a smooth, cohesive ball that we're gonna need until it just comes together and then we're gonna put it in a plastic bag or wrap it in plastic wrap and let it rest for five minutes. Don't waste all that extra flour, we're gonna need it later, so just sift it out before retrieving our now nicely relaxed ball of dough, which is now gonna be a lot easier to knead for seven to eight minutes until super smooth and taut. Now we're gonna place it back in the plastic bag and let it rest for 30 minutes, just enough time to get started on a tiny batch of sauce. Into our smallest saute pan goes about a tablespoon of olive oil, a quarter shallot, and half a clove of garlic grated on our very smallest grater. Mix it around with our tiny spatula before adding about a cup of tomato puree. Mix everybody together, lower the heat, and then we're going to add a little tiny pinch of oregano, a tiny pinch of dried basil, and an extra tiny pinch of crushed red pepper flake. Any more than one or two flakes and this is going to come out really spicy. Bring this to a bare simmer and let it go for about half an hour and until nice and thick and the tomato's acidity has mellowed. Then we're headed back over to the worktop where we're gonna start rolling out our pasta. First, we're gonna divide the dough into four equally sized pieces, set it onto a well-floured surface and roll it out using the smallest rolling pin you can find, just thin enough that it can pass through the widest setting on your pasta roller. Then through said widest setting, we're going to start rolling out the sheet of dough, folding the dough into thirds and rolling it back out and passing it through two times in order to laminate the dough and build up the gluten network which is going to help our pasta turn out a bit more toothsome. Then, one notch at a time on the pasta roller, we're going to roll the dough out thinner and thinner until it's as thin as nature will allow, and the ghostly specter of your hand can be seen through it when held up to the light. And now I had to craft a sort of tiny lasagna pan for which I thought this box of tea would make a good template. I'm using aluminum foil here because it's the best option I have, but take note that you generally don't want to cook lasagna or any tomato-based food in aluminum. It's perfectly safe, but aluminum is what's known as a reactive cookware, and any especially acidic foods like tomatoes cooked for more than 30 minutes can pick up a sort of off metallic taste. But for our purposes today, this little guy is going to work just fine. I'm going to start by laying down a little smear of tomato sauce. This is going to sort of act like a protective glue for our bottom lasagna noodle, which I'm going to cut using this tiny pizza cutter and the tea box as a template, so as the noodles will fit inside our lasagna pan like a noodly glove. Then I'm going to spread a little bit more sauce on top of this first noodle, grab my tiny block of low moisture mozzarella out of the freezer and introduce you to the tiny cheese grater. Somebody gave this to me while I was on my book tour and it's been waiting in my drawer to make its auspicious debut. So I'm just gonna grate a layer of mozzarella in there followed by a layer of ricotta cheese, applied of course with a tiny spoon. I'm not usually a ricotta in my lasagna kind of guy, I'm more of a bechamel stud, but I wanna keep this as classic as possible. And to top the ricotta goes a little grating of Parmesan cheese. And now since I'm sure you wanna see what the hell's going on in here. I've got some amateur iPhone footage of the scene. As you can see, I'm laying a noodle down atop our cheese and sauce, topping that noodle with another tiny spoonful of sauce and repeating the process for as many layers as the lasagna pan will support. In my case, I got about four full layers in there. Then on top goes a little bit more sauce and Parmesan, and this guy is ready for the oven, or rather the toaster oven. And just like any lasagna, we want to bake it covered for the first 30 or so minutes of baking, so as to prevent the top noodle from drying out and the cheese from burning. This guy's headed into a 325 degree Fahrenheit toaster oven for about 25 minutes before we take it out, remove the cover, and take a 
look to make sure that everybody's holding together. As you can see, we've got a little cheese bubble up, but no big deal. I'm gonna grate a little bit more Parmesan cheese on top before returning this guy to a now 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for about five, 10 minutes until golden brown and bubbly on top. Now, rather foolishly, I did not apply nonstick spray to my lasagna pan before baking. So this guy needs to cool off almost completely before I can even try to get it out in one piece. Being so small, this only took about a half an hour. But Babish, I hear you saying, that looks like a normal sized piece of lasagna to me. Well, remember this is a whole pan of lasagna and thus contains at least six servings. So I'm just gonna slice this guy up with a very sharp knife and let's see if we managed a halfway decent one inch tall cross section. Yeah, man, that's tiny lasagna. Let's switch over to the macro lens so we can see all those distinct layers and dig in. I noticed that the patrons of Little Bits were using full-size silverware, so I'm gonna do the same. I wanted to eat it in one bite, but that's how you get food stuck in your lips. And I want the food that's tiny and tiny and small and just fits, just fits right in. And that's what we got here, a tiny member of the Clean Plate Club. But wouldn't you know it, I'm still hungry. So how about we take a crack at tiny pizza? Into the bowl of a stand mixer goes 500 grams of bread flour, eight grams of kosher salt. Into a measuring cup goes 350 grams of tepid water and two grams of yeast. And here comes our old friend, Tiny Whisk, to whisk them both together. Just whisk them both a little bit. And that's about all for you, little buddy. Rest well, you've earned it. Let the yeast bloom for about 10 minutes at room temperature before adding to the flour and salt mixture. Attach dough hooks and mix together for about two minutes and then knead on medium speed for six to eight minutes until the dough is smooth and supple and elastic. We're then gonna retrieve the dough, which should be pretty sticky, but not too sticky. Enough that we can give it a few cursory needs on an unfloured work surface. Roll it into a smooth, taut ball, where we're going to let it rise in a covered, oiled bowl for 18 hours, followed by an overnight stay in the fridge in a process known as cold fermenting. And then hang on to your plumbus, because we're going on a little field trip. Oh, pets. To my new house. This is my new home kitchen in Brooklyn. It is not the new Binging with Babish studio that is under construction downstairs in the basement. We're visiting here today because I have a little backyard where we can operate a pizza oven much more safely and much more within the confines of the law. So we are retrieving our cold fermented dough and normally we would just divide it in half and on an unfloured work surface, stretch it into a taut ball, which we're gonna prove at room temperature for two to three hours, but not when we're making little bits. I'm hanging on to one of these dough balls so I can make pizza for myself for dinner, but the other I am dividing into smaller and smaller pieces, pressing up through my fingers to form a miniature version of the pizza dough that we're going to proof. I don't really know how well these are going to work in a wood-fired oven, so I'm going to go with a bunch of different sizes here, from relatively small to extremely small, but the procedure is very much the same. We just want it to be a ball with a smooth, evenly stretched surface, which we're going to cover and proof at room temperature for maybe more like an hour because they're so small. We're looking for them to puff up, but not necessarily double in size. Once proved, proofed, proven, once nice and puffy, we're gonna grab our favorite ball, keep the other ones covered so they don't dry out, and give our dough ball a little bath in all-purpose flour before pressing and stretching them out into a pizza. I'm not the most dexterous of dudes, so this proved to be a little bit of a challenge, but eventually I got it out to a little round about three inches wide, which I then repeatedly stabbed with a very, very sharp knife because cold fermented dough is notoriously bubbly, and one errant bubble could turn this into more of a pizza puff than a pizza. So from there, we're topping pretty much like a normal pizza, a spoonful of sauce, some tiny torn morsels of buffalo mozzarella, and some tiny pepperoni that I cut out of pepperoni. Then we're getting this onto our pizza peel and bringing it over to a preheated 900 degree Fahrenheit pizza oven, where we're gonna let it sit for about 30 seconds before rotating it, letting it cook for a sum total of about 60 seconds, until it's nicely puffed and the cheese is melted and there are lovely little charred dots bespeckling its crust. And there you have it, 60 seconds later, we've got ourselves a tiny pizza. At first I thought it was too cute to eat, and then I remembered in the world of Rick and Morty, nothing is too cute to eat. Whoa, that is a scary sentence. But hey, look at this, we got a tiny cheese stretch. And I gotta tell you, there's something really satisfying about eating a whole slice of pizza in one bite. It makes me feel like a giant, or Matt Stoney. Anyway, it's time for dessert, so let's pack it up and head back to the lab. Oh, 
Woods, where we're gonna make us a tiny apple pie. I wasn't sure what kind of pie that was in the scene, but apple seemed like the best candidate for tinification. Into the bowl of a food processor goes 175 grams of all-purpose flour, about one tablespoon of granulated sugar, and a hefty pinch of kosher salt. Just go ahead and pulse those together a few times until they are well combined. And then we are dotting the top of this mixture with one stick of cold, unsalted, thinly sliced butter. We're then gonna pulse this together 15 to 20 times until the mixture resembles wet sand. Normally we would want to keep pieces of butter about the size of peas in there, but because of the small form factor, I don't want too much expansion in this crust. We're transferring the butter flour mixture to a large bowl and sprinkling about 100 milliliters of ice cold water over top. Then we're gonna mix this together using a rubber spatula and our hands until it just barely holds its shape, at which point we're gonna press it into a disc, wrap it in plastic wrap or throw it in a plastic bag and fridge for at least one hour, ideally up to four, during which time we can make our apple pie filling. I'm just gonna peel, core, and finely mince one medium honey crisp apple. That is all we're gonna need for this recipe. Cut it into evenly sized pieces that are tiny and tiny and throw them in a bowl with about a quarter cup of granulated sugar, the zest of about half a lemon and the juice of about a quarter of a lemon, maybe about a quarter cup of light brown sugar, maybe about a half a teaspoon of cinnamon and very tiny sprinklings of each of the following, ground cloves, ground ginger and freshly grated nutmeg. Y'all know how I feel about freshly grated nutmeg. Give that a nice little stir with a regular sized spatula if your tiny one is in the dishwasher. And the best way to tell if it's ready is to give it a taste. Does it taste like apple pie filling? Nice. Also, we're gonna add about a tablespoon of all-purpose flour. This is gonna help thicken the eventual ooey gooey pie filling. Then on a very well-floured surface, we are rolling out our pie dough and readying our baking vessel of choice. The smallest thing I could find was this cupcake tin. So we wanna cut out rounds of dough slightly larger than the cupcake cavity. Note to self, new name for ska band, cupcake cavity? Eh, that's not that good. Anyway, we are then pressing our dough rounds into the cupcake cavity, and you'll notice that mine are a little too small. We want at least a half inch overhang outside the cavity. I honestly don't know what else to call it. Cupcake hole? Note to self, name for new restaurant, the cupcake hole. That's, that's not good either. Anyway, now we're filling our pie shells with the apple filling and cutting slightly smaller rounds of dough that will only cover the overhang, whose edges we're gonna brush with a little bit of beaten egg white so as to form a seal. It's kinda hard to make out what I'm doing here, but I'm just pressing the dough together and trying to fold it under itself so as to prevent a pie filling blowout. Note to self, pie filling bl no, no, that's nothing. Then I'm just gonna crimp the edges decoratively the way that I would a normal sized pie. And there you have it, some little pies the size of cupcakes. I know that these are a little bit big for little bits, but I tried it with a mini muffin pan and they were too small to cut. Anyway, we are cutting X-shaped vents in the top, brushing them down with egg white and sprinkling with Demerara sugar. Then we're placing these guys in a 325 degree Fahrenheit toaster oven for about 30 minutes. As you can see, my first attempt exploded, but the other two survived the journey. And because I forgot to apply non stick spray to my pan again. I'm gonna try to get these guys out and onto a cooling rack as fast as humanly possible. And they made it, where they now need to cool completely. With a normal sized pie, you'd be looking at about four hours. Again, with these guys, 45 minutes. Let's bust out the macro lens. And look at that, it still has a nice flaky crust and no soggy bottom. Oh, you would like your tiny pie a la mode? Of course, we have a tiny ice cream scoop at the ready. And unfortunately, trying to eat this pie normal style with a fork kind of ruins it. But that's the price you pay when you're living in a universe where your mouth is tiny and small. And I gotta say, it's a pretty good apple pie. Well spiced, nice flaky crust, and another member of the Clean Plate Club. So there you have it folks, a fitting way to celebrate the return of Rick and Morty some little bits. I'm sorry I skipped the tiny fried eggs. I was gonna use quail eggs, but those are surprisingly hard to find during a pandemic. But I did eat a whole pizza, a plate of lasagna, and a slice of apple pie. It was a miniature mukbang.